Did you bring your copy of God's Word with you? Would you turn with me to the book of Ephesians? We read it last week, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. It's one of the letters that Paul wrote, uh, 13 letters, epistles in the New Testament. Ephesians, about halfway through the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, I, I'm, I, there's several different ways we could read this, but I want to read it from the Passion Translation again. Better, better said as the Passion Paraphrase. But it says it this way, never doubt God's power. That's a command. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imaginations. Well, I don't know about the other locations. It's a little quiet here this morning. Uh, I want to tell you, church, that's, some, that's a powerful truth. That's a powerful truth. And, and, and here it's, it's important for us to understand that as individuals, to keep stretching and, and to believe in God for more. But, but actually, the, the context of Ephesians 3.20, if you read verses 19 to 21, it's a really about the church. It's not about individuals. It's about the corporate when we come together and we all dream big together and row in the same direction, the power of synergy is unstoppable. The devil does not have a chance. He cannot prevail against a mobilized church that's focused on the mission. And we are focused. Focused. Historically, we know. We know this truth. We have lived this truth. We have seen this truth as a church. We know beyond a shadow of doubt that we serve a God of the infinitely more. I shared with you a number of stories last week. I'll just uh, remind you briefly. When we went down to Cuba, we had the faith to believe, which was a stretch, the belief for three churches, to, uh, to buy the houses, renovate them, and convert them to a church and, uh, and, and so they could have church there, multiple services. We didn't buy three, we bought 42 because God got involved and breathed upon the vision and, and went beyond those 42. We were able to, to, to hire all 42 of those pastors for the first year and give leadership uh, to those churches. Down in India, we set out to, to, to translate a Bible. It was a daunting task. It was way more money than we could afford. And, and yet God breathed into it. He's the God of the infinitely more. We not only had enough come in for the translation of the Bible, but, but we also were able to, to, uh, to mass uh, print the Bible and do a mass distribution throughout the entire uh, region of our unreached people group. Down in Uganda, we had the faith to believe that we could replace the doors on a church that, that, that uh, thieves had broken in and stolen the sound system. It was a center block church, but so much more came in that we were able to not only buy all the doors but we, and not only buy all the windows and secure the building, but we were able to replace the sound system with something far better than they had and, and to bring lights to them. And, and uh, they had me back to preach, and it was an awesome service it was an amazing experience. Down in Mexico, we, uh, we, we had the faith to renovate a building. It was an expensive thing to, to convert a, an old car garage into a church. Uh, but, but the Lord breathed upon the vision, multiplied it. He's the God of the infinitely more. We're able to end up uh, buying the pastor's house, paid for it all. It's, it, we're debt-free in Mexico. Uh, we went back and built a, 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 a medical clinic. We worked out of that clinic last summer. We're going to be working out of that clinic again this summer. And, uh, and just to let you know how God works, we were in this project. We, we knew that we couldn't afford it, but we were praying and asking God to breathe upon it. And we got a call from ICM down in Hampton, uh, International Cooperating Ministries, and they said, we hear you have an interest in Mexico. So do we. Would you mind if we partner with you guys dollar for dollar? We'll match every money piece that you come in. And we didn't call them. They called us. That's what God does. He's the God of the infinitely more. 
Down in Haiti, we, 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 uh, we had the vision to restore their ministry headquarters after, after uh, an earthquake, and then five days later, they had a hurricane. It was devastated, but we raised the money to not only rebuild their, rest, their um, ministry headquarters, but also 12 churches, three schools, and one orphanage, all under the same ministry. I want to tell you, church, we serve a God of the infinitely more. We serve a God of the infinitely more. And it's also worked here at home. Now, these are missions projects, but over and over and over and over, God has provided. Here at this location, we've got a couple of, uh, of um, uh, very expensive uh, high-res uh, projectors so that we could all participate and have the, have the words on the screen. We have the screens in all of our locations. And, and one, one month, a, a few years ago, one month, uh, the first one uh, burned out. And, uh, and then the second one burned out two weeks later. And we, we had, imagine trying to have church in this day and age without, without projectors having the words on the screen. We don't have hymn books, all right? And, and, and so we were thinking, how are we going to do this? We have absolutely no, no more money. We're a faith-based organization. And uh, we, we're faith week to week uh, asking God to provide. It's miraculous. And, and so we, we said, God, what are you going to do? we got to have these projectors, and we didn't have the money to buy them. And so I just told the church one Sunday, I'm sorry, we can't have the words on the screen. The, the projectors broke, and we're just praying for God to provide. We did not take up an offering. We didn't ask for people to give to it. We gave it to God, all right? That's when you know you got faith, when you give it to God and start having to, to manipulate somebody else. We said, Lord, this is your problem. This is not our problem. You build the church. Did you know that there was a guest in the audience? He got relocated here for a three-week assignment. A three-week assignment of all places, Williamsburg, okay, not a big city. And, uh, and he was relocated here. He was in the audience that day. God stirred his heart. Um, he, he, he really connected with the message that was preached that day. And uh, as I was walking through the children's area, going, uh, leaving the church, he met me in the children's area, and he said, uh, I work at a place, a high-tech company, and we deal with those projectors. Do you mind if I provide those projectors for you? And so uh, th he was here three weeks. He made the order, and, 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 and the next week he was here with us in the service, and then he was gone. I've never seen him again. I don't know where he is. It was like an angel showed up and said, I got this. That's the God we serve. We serve a God of the infinitely more. That is true in your own life. It's true in our church. We're just an example of what you can exercise in your own life. And so we thought, hey, since God keeps doing more and more and more, then why don't we think really big and dare him to see what he can do? Is he truly unlimited? Is he the God of the infinitely more or just the really big more? And so uh, we started praying last year, and we started, okay, God, we want to be the most ambitious yet. We've come out of COVID. We're strong. God's good. And, uh, and so we said, you know, instead of adopting one project, like all, all those projects were that we talked about, why don't we contact all of our partners, ask all of them what their vision is, and, 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 and add it all up and, and, and ask them what they needed, Find out what, they, what, what all their projects, let's adopt all their projects, not just one project. That's absolutely crazy. It came to a whopping $650,000. That's over and above our tithes for operations to keep the, the local church strong. And so uh, we just believe that that's what God's called us to do in 2023, to take this on and to adopt these other projects. We've got a, a catalog out in the lobby. Uh, you can do it online as well crosswalk.cc uh, slash kingdom builders and you can see all the projects all the partners and um, and it's just really really exciting so how are we going to do this I shared this with you last week just a review real quick before we get into the into the scriptures but how are we going to exercise this corporate uh, step of faith where we see the synergy of all of us together being so powerful that it's unstoppable, the, the principle of synergy, how can we do this? And so uh, I showed this with you last week. We have a big bucket called tithes. This is our first 10% that goes to keep the home church strong. And then we have all these smaller buckets of ministries. And what we're going to do is we're going to combine all these uh, uh, projects. Each one of these is a project that they've let us know what, we, what they, we, they want us to do this year. And we're going to combine all these projects into one bucket 
called Kingdom Builders, and now it's just a two-bucket church. Not a, not a multiple-bucket church, just a two-bucket church. Your first 10% goes to keep the local church strong, and then over and above our tithe goes to expand the missions of the church, pulling all these together. It's like a, it's like a giant mutual fund. All right, so it's a diversified portfolio. You got all these different, uh, all these different ways to invest in the kingdom inside, and uh, you got you got the portfolio manager. That's the pastors of our church that are connecting with the missionaries and assessing uh, what the best E R O I is, the best eternal return on investment, and that's the best way to invest. And so we're finding that. When we pull all of our resources together, synergy, all rowing in the same direction, all focused on the same mission, then it's a very, very powerful force that the devil cannot prevail. Let me give, just give you one example just since last Sunday. This is so, so fresh. The ink on the, on the notes is still wet. Well, almost. All right? So last week, last week I showed you a video of, uh, of just one of our partners, of just one of the projects that we've adopted for 2023. Uh, the video was uh, produced by Reynolds and Kathy Maines. They were uh, very successful entrepreneurs in Canada, and, uh, and, and, and God just helped them to build an empire. And, uh, and they felt of, called of God to sell everything they have and to move to Gulu. All right, uh, the second largest city in Uganda where 150,000 children live and they felt called of God to move there to build a giant children's center uh, that will attract children with quality play and then win them to Jesus. By the way, Reynolds and Kathy's daughter, married daughter and son-in-law who was a former professional football player they, uh, they also felt called to go with their mom and dad, sell everything out, and go to Gulu and serve with their mom and dad to help advance the kingdom. That's the power of family ministry. I don't know if anybody knows anything about that, but anyway, uh, it's just powerful what, when God stirs hearts. And so within a generation, the, the mains want to, uh, and, and their daughter and son-in-law, they want to see, um, see city transformation happen by winning the children and then uh, watching them grow up to serve Jesus. Well, they presented this project to us last week by video. It's a theater where they will present the gospel. It's a part of this whole children's concept. And they said that if we build it, if we pay the funds to build it, then they would call it the Crosswalk Theater, which we didn't ask for. That's kind of them. And, uh, and they also, at the end of the video, they said, and if you'd like, we'd like to invite your team to come and dedicate the building and, uh, and also do a, a, a week of service. And so, you know, if you were here last week, we didn't take up an offering. We did not uh, uh, put any pressure on anybody. We didn't take any pledges. We just put the information out there and said, God, and we're going to let you stir hearts. That's all we're going to do. Well, uh, guess what? God did start stirring hearts. In just one week, we had so much funds come in that we're able to now forward a pretty significant installment to that project. That's God stirring hearts. And, and we had a number of people after church Say, we want to go to Gulu. We want to, when's the team going? And so now, after this week, Alexander's been working really hard. We have the dates for the trip. We have the cost for the trip. We've got the project that we're going to do over there on the trip. Guess what? Crosswalk is going to Gulu. <laughs> Next fall. That's the compounding power of synergy all rowing in the same direction. That's just one project. We're well on our way. You'll hear more details on this in just a few minutes, but we're well on our way with other projects that we've adopted, and uh, we'll be giving reports uh, uh, regularly to those that are on the Kingdom Builder team, and if you want to join that team, just come and see me. But let me, let me give you some biblical examples about the above tithe giving to accelerate missions, and it's in your, in your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Would you just flip back from Ephesians uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 
1 Corinthians chapter 16. And what, what I'd like to do today for the rest of this message is just give a verse-by-verse -verse commentary and application of what Paul already established. He was the example. We're just following the template, okay? This is nothing new. It's 2,000 years old. A uh, little bit of background. Uh, the Apostle Paul went on two uh, tours of the Mediterranean to win souls and to plant churches in Western Asia and Eastern Europe. The first tour is described in Acts chapter 13 and 14. The second tour is described in Acts chapters uh, 16 through 18. But then Paul went on a third tour. That third tour was the largest tour, is the longest and the most extensive. It was, uh, it's described in Acts 19 through 21. Uh, Paul's purpose for that particular tour was to inspect all the churches that he had planted. It was also to sort out all their doctrinal errors, and we have 13 letters uh, correcting some of those things. But it was also to collect funds from all those churches to take back a significant donation to the persecuted church and the impoverished people in Israel. That was the purpose of that third trip. You see, from God's perspective, we're all just one big happy family and we're expected by God to help each other. That's the nature of the kingdom. And so we get a glimpse of Paul's principles and methodology from his two letters in Corinthians. Let's just now go through verse by verse, okay? Beginning in verse 1, he says, Now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem. First of all, if you've got questions about crosswalk collecting money for projects that are outside of the four walls of this church, you're not alone. The Corinthians had the same questions. And Paul was glad to answer those questions. We're glad to answer those questions. We want to use his letters as a template. But I want you to notice something here. Notice that the funds that he was collecting were not for the operations of the local church where he planted. Do you see that? Uh, no, those funds were for somewhere else far away. The Corinthians' tithes went to the Corinthian church. But they're over and above giving. They were, already, they were already giving out of obedience to God's instructions, but they're above and beyond giving. They're over and above the tithe giving was to missions. It was to somewhere else outside the four walls. And we're going to see that, that their above and beyond giving was not required. It's not required in Scripture. It's not a command anywhere. God's not telling us you got to do this. No, it was a result of their hearts being stirred by the Holy Spirit to do things for the kingdom. And that's when we know it's true, when God stirs the hearts, and we saw that all week this week. Our operations director was shocked every day as funds kept coming in and we never even asked. But what happens when God stirs your heart is that your money management priorities change accordingly. It's interesting how that works. And so we just need to lean on the Lord. We don't have to put pressure on anybody or anything like that. Uh, continuing in this passage, uh, continuing in verse 1, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. So we see that this is a template. It, it works over and over and over in different places. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait and try to collect it all at once. So in keeping with biblical instruction, what we want to do here is make a, a weekly commitment, at the most a monthly commitment to kingdom builders, and that way, that way as, as we see things happen, what God's calling us to do won't seem so impossible. We're eating the elephant one bite at a time. You see that? That's, that's Paul's, Paul's way. Now, a little bit of context here, who Paul's talking to. Corinth was a very prosperous city. It was on a trade route in Greece, uh, but Israel, on the other end, was very impoverished, and the church was, was, uh, was persecuted. And so out of their abundance, out of their abundance, the Corinthians were invited by the Holy Spirit to build God's kingdom where it would be most needed. Can I just tell you, America is like Corinth. 
We are prosperous. We are prosperous. But most of the rest of the world is impoverished. And so out of our abundance, out of our abundance, God is inviting us to build his kingdom where it's needed most. Now, as soon as I say that, most of you probably don't think of yourself as being very prosperous. And I, I understand that. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. I understand that. Most of us don't have anything left over. But may I kindly and gently suggest that it might be because we're feeding a lifestyle that's proper, prosperous. <laughs> and that's why we live paycheck to paycheck. Compared to the rest of the world, I mean. In fact, may I just say the poorest person in this room or the poorest person listening, the poorest person listening is still more wealthy than most everybody else in the world. According to world standards. Let me give you an example. How many of you this morning, when you got up, you went to the tap and it was just a matter of turning a... Uh, flicking a, a handle or turning a knob and just clean water came out. How many of you had that? Running water. Just voila, right there. Just turn the knob and it just, it's there. As abundant as you want. Did you know, did you know that one out of every four people in the world do not have that? Running water. Clean running water. One out of every four people, well, they have running water. It's send the smallest child to the city well to, with a bucket and to come back as fast as you can. That's their running water. One out of every four people in the world do not have what you had this morning. How many of you, when you got up this morning, you thought, oh, man, I'm going to help myself wake up. I'm going to get in the shower, and I'm going to fix the knobs just right so I can feel the heat coming down of the hot water. How many of you enjoyed that hot shower this morning? Can I just see your hands? Can I just tell you that very few people in the world have the choice of hot water and cold water. They have to go boil their water and they use it sporadically for, for cooking and other things, but they don't have the choice of having a hot shower. How many of you... This morning, you just got up and you flicked a switch and all of a sudden, magical, the lights came on. How many of you had that? You got electricity that runs to your house. Probably take it for granted, wouldn't even think it. Did you know that one out of every four people in the world do not have electricity running to their place of residence? One out of every four. How many of you have at least one indoor toilet? Can I just see your hands? You don't have to go outside. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that Half of the world do not have, does not have a toilet inside their house where they just flush and it goes out automatically. We don't know where it goes. Again, the youngest child has to take it in a bucket to the, the outside and bury it somewhere, all right? We could talk about how one out of every uh, 10 people have a car, and you probably have a car, maybe multiple cars, uh, how many of you have at least one appliance in your house? Can I just see your hand? You got a refrigerator, or if you don't have a refrigerator, you got a washer, or if you don't have a, a clothes washer, you might have uh, an oven. How many of you have one of those? All right. Did you know that that half, less than half of the world has more than one appliance? How many of you enjoy your air conditioning and heating, your HVAC system? Yeah, you have that in your house. All right, so when it's cold, you can heat it up, or when it's hot, you can cool it down. How many of you have that feature? Isn't that cool? Did you know that one out of every 10 people in the world do not have that, uh, has that? They have that privilege. One out of every 10. You are one out of, for every one of you that raise your hand, there are nine other people that do not have air conditioning and heating in their house. When it's hot outside, they're hot. When it's cold outside, they're cold. How many of you have at least one computer in your house? Okay, laptop or iPad or desktop. Okay, did you know that only 4% of the world has that? How many of you have ever ordered something on Amazon and got it delivered the next day? Can I just tell you that's a very, very rare privilege. Nobody has that outside of our country. 
and we can talk about education. How many of you have more than a fifth grade education? Anybody here have more than a fifth grade education? How many know education is what helps us advance in our standard of living? Did you know that, that one out of every two people have a, a more than a fifth grade education? One out of every two people in the world. Okay, now you're thinking, well, man, I've been, to, I've been to Europe and I've been to South America, I've been to these places, and that's not true. I've, I know a lot of people that are educated, but you probably haven't been to the most densely populations of the world where, 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 where they just don't have schools. And so we are rich. We are absolutely rich compared to world standards. And so out of our abundance, and you may not have thought yourself as abundant, but it's all relative, out of our abundance, God is calling us to invest in Christ-transforming ways to build his kingdom. He invites us to do that, and he stirs our hearts. Did you know that even when we don't have abundance, and there may be some exceptions in the room here today, maybe you've got to run to the outhouse, I don't know, but even when we don't have abundance, did you know that we could still participate? You see, this letter was written to the Corinthians, prosperous Corinthians, but Paul was actually writing about somebody else, the Macedonians. Let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He picks up from where he left off in the first letter. Now, I want you to know, talking to the Corinthians, prosperous, I want you to know what God in his kindness has done to the churches in Macedonia. Very different set of circumstances. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. And so you may be looking around today, and you see a lot of rich Corinthians around that. Maybe you're watching some from somewhere else, and you, you look around and go, man, they're, they're probably Corinthians, they're Corinthians, they're Corinthians. I'm not a Corinthian. I'm a Macedonian. I ain't got nothing. Okay, that's a bad English. I don't have anything. All right? And you may be thinking about that about yourself. And you're not alone. This scripture talks to you too. You're, if you're a Macedonian, welcome to the club. You're not left out. You get to participate. Did you know that? Nobody's left out. This is fun. Uh, verse 2, but they are also, speaking of the poor Macedonians, they are also filled with abundant joy which is overflowed in rich generosity. Do you see that? Giving is not circumstantial. Getting to participate in building the kingdom is all about an attitude of the heart. For I can testify that they gave, the poor Macedonians, not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. I didn't pressure them, I didn't manipulate them, we didn't do a capital campaign. And they did it of their own free will. Now, look at this. Look at this. Are you ready for this? This is the highlight for me. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Wow. May this same attitude be characteristic of us here at this church. May this same attitude be of us. I want to tell you, friends, you may be tested this morning. You may be troubled this morning. You may be distressed. But I want to invite you to beg God again and again. Don't, don't just ask him once, but say, God, I'm telling you again, I want to participate in this. I don't have anything left over. I have no margin in my life. Would you do a miracle in my life so that I could participate and help build the kingdom? Would you do that, God? And you ask him that tomorrow. You ask him that on Tuesday. You ask him that on Wednesday. Just keep asking God. God, again and again, I'm going to come to you. Would you please let me get to participate? I can't do it on my own, but would you help me? Would you provide a little margin in my life so I can do this? It's beautiful. I'd like to invite a friend of mine to come up here. Madison, honey, would you come up here just for a second? I just want to introduce you to one of Crosswalk's kingdom builders. Would you just welcome Madison to this? All right. Madison, honey, how old are you? Eleven and a half. 
That half is important. Uh, her mother doesn't use the word half. She just gives a round number. But uh, 11 years, so you're under 12. And, uh, and, and Madison, how long have you been a part of this church? Forever. My whole life. Well, we're only 21 years old, so. Uh, uh, but you've been a part of this church all your life. Yep. When your mom moved here, she was expectant with you. And she has stayed here for almost 12 years now. Uh, I think that speaks of longevity. I think that's important. We, we deal with our differences. We resolve them like the Bible says, and we keep our relationships. <laughs> we don't keep bouncing around. Oh, that's a different sermon. I'm supposed to be talking about kingdom builders. Okay. All right. So, Madison, uh, you're, you're under 12. Do you have a job? No. You don't have a job. Okay. Uh, so, but you do have access to some money. H how do you get money? My grandparents. So your grandparents bless you. Enjoy that. My grandparents are gone to be with Jesus. I don't have grandparents, so you enjoy that as long as you can. I know her grandparents. Mm. All right. And so they've, they've blessed you with, um, let me talk to me about your home life. Um, who, who do you live with? And I live with my mom here, and my dad lives in Delaware. Okay, so you're in a single parent home. Are you rich? No. Oh, you're not rich? Okay. Uh, neither is anybody here listening. Um, so last Sunday, you heard the sermon. How did you hear the sermon, by the way? At home because I was sick. Oh, your mom is a champion. Even though you were sick, you had a good excuse to stay home and do something else, but you participated in church. Oh, isn't that awesome? I love it. And so you heard the vision about joining a kingdom builders and, and, and giving above and beyond our tithe to, to, uh, to help advance and accelerate the mission of, of our missionary partners abroad. And, and so what did you do? I gave all my money. You gave everything? Yep. You don't have anything left? Nope. Wow. You know, Jesus watched uh, a lady give all that she had. And Jesus said she gave more than anybody else. Did you know you gave more than I did last Sunday? Did you know that? Yeah, yeah you gave it all. Because it's all relative. It's all, yeah, it's not about the amount. It's about what's in her heart. And you gave all you had. You gave more than anybody here. Look around. Did you see a lot of Corinthians here? You gave a lot more than they did because you gave it all. And, and so you're a kingdom builder. A kingdom builder is anybody that gives just a dollar over their regular tithes. And you did. You gave it all. You didn't have to give it all, but you did because God stirred your heart, didn't he? Would you give it up for Madison? So proud of you. There was another person in our church. She's a nurse. She said, you know, I, I, I told her about this vision last October. And she said, well, I'm just a nurse. I, I can't be a kingdom builder because I'm just a nurse. I don't have a lot of money. I don't make a lot. And, uh, and I said, no, anybody that gives anything above and beyond their tithe is a kingdom builder, and she, so she said, you know what, I'm going to do that. And since October, God has miraculously provided for her. She's been given a, a, a raise at her hospital and different things. I want to tell you something. This is exciting. This is exciting. If a child can be a kingdom builder, then any of us can be a kingdom builder. <laughs> Verse 6. So we have urged Titus to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Can I just tell you that like the Corinthian, our Corinthian counterparts, the folks here at Crosswalk Church are excelling in so many ways. We've got excellent campus pastors who preach amazingly. By the way, they'll be all pre-preaching in our locations next Sunday. Uh, we've, got, we've got amazing worship in all of our locations. We are excelling in so many ways. We've got wonderful infrastructural systems. We've got everything. 
We've, we've, it's been excelling in so many ways. God has been gracious to us. And I want to tell you something. You're also excelling in your giving. You're excelling in that way. We have a culture here at this church of, of generosity. It's just part of who we are. I'll give you some examples. Just since the first of the year, did you know we've only had three Sundays so far? This is the fourth Sunday. Just in the first, we've not taken up an extra offering or anything like that. We only started mentioning it last week. Did you know that we've had over $35,000 come in for Kingdom Builders already in the three weeks? So we're already starting do, uh, several installments of several of our projects. Uh, uh, let me give you, just give you some projects. At Blaine Blayton Elementary School, we adopted that school as, a, as one of ours. It's a public school, but we said, you know what? They have at-risk children. They have 22 at-risk children. The counselor was asking for help. We said, we want to be a part. And so we have, we're providing for 22 children. We're providing every single day. We're providing breakfast, lunch, and snacks. We asked for the snacks, all right? Because we want to go above and beyond what's requested. And we're providing hygiene materials for those 22 at-risk students. Uh, in Puerto Vallarta, the, the church that we planted down there, they've outgrown their children's area. They asked us for help at one of the projects. We've already given the installment because of the generous January. We've already given them installment for expand their children's area. Uh, for our community of faith, did you know that we had 20, we served 29 different homeless people in this community this week as we, as we transformed this facility into a homeless shelter for the week. They slept here, we fed them. We didn't just feed them uh, cheap meals either. We went to Carabas. We blessed these folks. They ain't better than I did this week. Well, I'm fasting, but, but uh, they, they ain't better than I did. At Letitia's house, we were able to buy them a new set of pots and pans for their, for their uh, shelter home this week. Uh, we, we mentioned a church plant down in Wilmington, South, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. We were helping that church get started. Today is their launch day. We're helping another church in Washington, D.C. get started, uh, a launching uh, in a two weeks. So we're sending money to them this month. Uh, we've already helped relocate the 55 orphans in Myanmar you, you knew that we have a, 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 an orphanage there. Well, the, the military coup that's happened in, military, in, in Myanmar, they took over our orphan compound, and so our 55 children were displaced. We've relocated them to a safe place in the capital city, Yangon. We're also rebuilding them a church for them. We're doing all that, and we've already sent them, we're sending the money this week because of the generous January we've had. We're doing all of that, and we haven't had a chance to tell you all the projects yet, but we're already doing it because people say, I want to be a kingdom builder. I don't care where it goes. I just know it's going somewhere good. That's awesome. That's the way I treat my retirement. And that's all that's in addition to Gulu and what we're doing there. We're sending that installment there because so, so many people gave to that last week. So here, here's the math. $650,000 for the project for the year. If you divide that up by 12 months, that's $55 a month. $35,000's already come in for January. We haven't got started yet. And, well, it just started last week. So we're only $20,000 left. We are on this. In fact, we're watching the money come in this month, and we're going, and one of our staff members said, you know what? Uh, we, should have asked for, we should have asked for more projects. This is easy. It is easy when God rolls up his sleeves. He we serve a God of the infinitely more. Verse 8, I'm not commanding you to do this. Oh, I love that. I'm not commanding you. This is actually the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul's pen because he inspired it all. I am not commanding you to do this. The tithe is a command, the first 10%. That's what God expects. But over and above that, that's, that's not a command. That's only if God stirs your heart. And I don't know if he's doing that or not. I'm just seeing the evidence as we open the mail every single day. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. So there's no command here. There's no pressure we're not doing pledges. No one's going to call you as a follow-up call. We're not taking up special offerings. We're just praying and asking God, how would you like for me to be a part? That is it. That's all. 
and we watch the mail as he brings it in from stirring hearts. Isn't that a neat concept? No pressure. God, this is yours. Pressure's on God, actually. God, because I've already made it public, you got to deliver or we're going to be really embarrassed. So pray and ask God, how can I be a heart? And if he's be a part, if he's stirring your heart for the love of the lost, then, then you do what you want to do. If he opens your heart, and you'll discover the absolute joy of getting to be a part of accelerating the mission of the church. Look at how gentle, look at how gentle the Holy Spirit is. Somebody says, well, you're going to talk about giving this morning. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to squirm. No, the Holy Spirit's gentle because <laughs> our, our giving is a barometer of our heart. But look at, look at how gentle the Holy Spirit is. Verse 11, give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. So we're not talking about amount. We're not talking, you could be under 12 years old to give something, and the Lord is pleased because it's not about the how much. It's about the attitude. Was I eager or was I reluctant? And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. How nice. It's not about the amount. It's the attitude. Chapter 9, look at verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. It's the law of sowing and reaping. You not only get what you sow, but you get back more than you sow. Did you know that? It always happens every single time. So you must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure that's the crosswalk approach, no pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Isn't that cool? Did you know, someone told me one time when I was a young adult, Mark, you can give yourself out of a challenge, a financial challenge. If you ever have a challenge, start giving, and you watch God because he overprovides. I didn't realize that, but I, I've practiced that all my life. Anytime Pam and I have ever been facing a financial challenge, we said, you know what? Let's give ourselves out of this challenge because of right here what this verse says. God will generously provide all that you need, not what somebody else needs, what you need. Look at this. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Do you see how this works? Just start priming the, uh, priming the pump, saying, Lord, I don't have anything, but I want to give what I, I want to give, be generous, so that I can accelerate and start the process of what you provide back, more than what I need, so I can share with others, but you're going to meet everything I have. You can give yourself out of a challenge. You can give yourself out of a challenge. Verse 10. For God is the one who provides seed to the sower. God provides. God provides seed to the sower. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Worship team, if you could come on and back up and just help me land here. Do you see the economy of God here? Do you see the exciting economy of God? It's not about what your boss offers you as an income. It's about the God that we serve and how he multiplies. So if God is laying something on your heart today about the kingdom, and you decide to say, God, that's what I want to be a part of. I'm asking you to be a part, and, and you're giving me an opportunity to be a part then I want to tell you God will provide that. Not only that, but he will overprovide as he's done in our church because he's the God of the infinitely more. He's not stingy and he's not short. <laughs> God will overprovide so that your needs are met, but you'll have plenty left over to be a blessing to others. What an exciting concept. What an exciting concept.
Would you just pray about daring God to do something through you? See, God provides seed to the sower, to the sower, to the one that keeps casting. God does not provide seed to the keeper. God's not impressed by financial constipation. God provides seed to the sower. God provides. God looks at our heart and says, man, that guy's sowing. I'm going to give him some more to sow. This is fun watching him sow. I'm going to give him more to sow. Wouldn't that be a cool problem to have? God, I keep sowing. You keep giving me more to sow. You keep, I keep sowing. You keep giving me more to sow. God provides seed to the sower. You just have to decide, am I going to be a sower or am I going to be a spender? <laughs> Am I going to be a conduit where it flows through me or am I going to be a reservoir that just collects it all? Am I going to be a bottleneck or am I going to be a bottle opener? These are just analogies that we can connect with. In the same way, He will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity. So these cards are on your seats. You can take the card. It's called a Kingdom Builder uh, card. And on the back, it's got the plan. What's this, what you plan to do, your vision. This is what, if God stirs my heart and what, what I could do. And then the dream. This is only if God shows up. And no one's collecting these cards. No one's calling you. No one's following up. We're not taking up a special offering. None of that. Just take it home. Talk to your spouse. Pray about it. Write down something in faith. It's only for you. Put it somewhere where you will see it again. This is between you and the Lord. This is not, and then we're just going to believe God to provide for all of our missionary partners. Isn't that easy? <laughs> no problem. No pressure. That's just the beautiful way that God works. On your way out, if you want to pick up one of these uh, catalogs just to see where the, where the partners are, what the projects are, that'll be so much fun. Well, thank you for your indulgence two weeks in a row to be able to come to you and talk to you about this huge vision we have. It's not our vision. It's God's picture of a preferable future that he's given to us. How beautiful. How beautiful. How exciting. And I just, I just want to, I just want to pray over these cards at this time. Would you just hold that in your hand? You don't have to hold it up. Just hold it in your hand. Lord Jesus. I pray for my friends here today. You have stirred hearts all week long. Every single day, we've opened up our account and seen more flow in, most of it online giving, specifically related to your projects that you have laid on our hearts. God, we've seen a miracle this week. We've seen a miracle in Cuba and Haiti and Mexico and Myanmar. We've seen miracles throughout our history of our church, we also witnessed that this week as you stirred hearts for people to participate. And that's all we're asking. God, God, I beg you today, give me a chance to participate. And in my devotions tomorrow, I'm going to beg you again. On Tuesday, I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to keep asking you, God, let me be a part. I want to be a Macedonian full of joy and let it overflow in generosity. May that be characteristic of my dear friends. May that be characteristic of our church as we build momentum and accelerate the vision of meeting these projects around the world to plunder hell and populate heaven. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Across all of our locations, would you just stand with me? Just stand with me. We got one more prayer we want to pray. Just stand with me. Can we just bow our heads? If you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're missing out. And I want to give you a chance to invite Jesus into your heart right now. If you're not in the right relationship with Jesus, just Let's just reach up and ask Jesus to cleanse us, remove sin, 
eliminate all the barriers so that we can walk out of here today in relationship with him. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. I admit that I need you. I admit that I need you. I admit that I've done things wrong. I admit that I've done things wrong. I admit that there's a barrier. I admit that there's a barrier. I ask that you remove the barrier. I ask that you remove Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart. Give me a fresh start. Give me a fresh start. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in your cleansing power. I believe in your cleansing power. Wash me clean. Wash me clean. I confess all that I've ever done. I confess all that I've ever done. Give me a fresh start. Give me a fresh start. And I decide. And I decide to follow you. To follow you. The rest of my life. The rest of my life. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.